Welcome to those of you who are arriving. We're just gonna wait here for a minute or two while the attendee list uh, populates. Okay. Looks like people are still trickling in, so we'll wait for another couple of moments. All right. Well, why don't we get started now? So um, again, welcome to uh, this month's uh, CBITS uh, Digital Mental Health Webinar, which is held in collaboration with the Society for Digital Mental Health. Um, we've, you know, over the last couple of years, we've uh, had a lot of talks on digital, uh, you know, on interventions and sensing and so on. And one of the things that keeps coming up in questions uh, are are you know questions about privacy, questions about ethics, uh, uh, questions about uh, you know trustworthiness, and so uh, you know today um, we have uh, Katie Shilton that is going to answer all of those questions uh, more than I think we you know any of us have been able to do before. Um, so Katie is uh, is she's a, an associate professor in the College of Information Sciences in the University of Maryland. And she has, I think, spent pretty much her whole career, uh, you know, looking at these kinds of questions. Uh, her, her, pro, her, a lot of her research, including the Pervade Project, which she's going to talk about, has been funded by the National Science Foundation, and she's received funding from, from Google. Um, so without, uh, you know, without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to you, Katie. Oh, and, and folks, uh, also just a reminder, this is being recorded. And if you have questions, uh, please put them into the Q&A and we will go through and, and, um, and I'll ask them at the end. Katie? Thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, be joining all of you today. Um, so today, as David uh, promised, I'm going to focus on problems of trustworthiness in uh, forms of research, um, and particularly mental health research, that uh, rely on the rich information generated about people through their digital interactions. Um, but I wanna start with an acknowledgement. Um, this work is really a team effort that I'm gonna be uh, uh, sharing with you today. And I'm gonna talk more about the whole Pervade team in a few minutes, um, but I wanna particularly acknowledge my collaborator, Emmanuel Moss. Um, he's an anthropologist and now a postdoc at Cornell um, who was critical to shaping this talk and the paper it's based on. And in fact, sometimes we give this talk together. Um, so this is really shared material. A lot of the ideas are his, he's an amazing researcher. Um, um, and so I put contact information for him at the end of the talk too. Just wanna to acknowledge his work on this as well. Okay, so I'm gonna to start today by talking about what I mean when I talk about digital data research, um, particularly passive data collection um, in the mental health space uh, and, uh, and why there are trust problems and ethics problems in this area. Um, I'll talk a bit more about why existing research ethics guidance provided for data about people, uh, the Belmont Report and the US Common Rule aren't a great fit. They're not a perfect fit for guiding research that relies on large collections of human digital data. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about another discipline that has also struggled with a mismatch between existing ethics guidance and their own practices and data, which is ethnography. Um, and I'm gonna talk about some maybe surprising parallels between ethnography and digital data research, uh, parallels that have a lot to do with that mismatch to the common rule. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how those parallels can help us think through new approaches for trustworthy data use based on excavating two things that are too often paved over or flattened in data research and data science, participant awareness of data collection and attention to power relationships. 
Okay, digital data, I don't think I have to tell anybody in the seminar, has become a gold mine for data research and data science. Uh, using digital data un to understand people as well as to train systems to make predictions uh, for or decisions about people, um, all of this relies on digital interaction data. Uh, but new data collection methods have also raised new questions about ethics and participation in this sort of research. So you might remember uh, the furor set off by Facebook's 2014 emotional contagion study, uh, which was done by uh, in partnership with Cornell University researchers. Um, and analysis uh, by my colleague Casey Fiesler and co-authors has examined the backlash, the public backlash to the emotional contagion study. Um, and they used public comments on media articles to sort of understand what people were so upset about. And um, those comments revealed fundamental disagreements about what Facebook is, what a rela user's relationship to Facebook should be. And in particular, Facebook users objected to the feeling of living in a lab, that was a quote, living in a lab, being observed for study while going about their online lives. Um, and mistrust of research uses of online data is bigger than just Facebook. Um, a study of Twitter users by Fiesler and Perferis found that a majority of Twitter users were surprised that their tweets are used in research and feel that informed consent should be necessary. Respondents express willingness to participate in research with their tweets, but it depended on the purpose of the research, the re team and institution collecting the data and the mechanics of the data analysis. And we're even seeing a bit of a backlash in research that uses traditional informed consent methods. Um, a recent survey of habitual survey takers indicated that only 33% were willing to, to opt in to cell phone based data gathering in addition to taking a, you know, a traditional survey. Um, this study was conducted in Germany. It's, uh, I got the site here for you. That's the uh, uh, quote at the bottom. Um, it was conducted in Germany, so it may be a slightly more privacy sensitive population. Um, but I think that this is indicative. These are folks who regularly take social science surveys um, and they were saying, no, they didn't wanna opt into cell phone data tracking. And finally, and I think, and we're gonna be returning to this point in the talk, studies indicate that trust issues in digital data research may be even larger within marginalized communities uh, for pretty good reason, which we'll talk about. Okay, and importantly, this research backlash is occurring at the same time as a more general backlash against the platforms that create the data at the heart of much digital data research. There are now regular headlines, podcast episodes, even a major motion picture, or it's really, it's a Netflix documentary about what are increasingly viewed as the ethical failings of big tech. Uh, and the tech industry broadly has struggled with whether and how to talk about its politics, values, and social obligations, and its role in controlling the increasingly pervasive data about all of us. So what should digital data researchers do in the face of this kind of mistrust and uncertainty? Uh, with colleagues, I've been part of the Pervade project. This has been a five-year grant-funded project to study empirical questions in data ethics. Um, and at the heart of our project has been questions of trust in data research. And what we saw when we started looking into the ethics of data science and digital data research was that most of the solutions on the table already were reliant on approaches that had been developed for doing research ethics but weren't necessarily appropriate for the emerging paradigm of doing research with big digital data sets. So it's common for us to think about scientific knowledge as coming from conducting experiments. You have a hypothesis, you design an experiment to test it, that experiment disproves your hypothesis, or your hypothesis stands up to the experiment, becomes a more firm piece of knowledge. Experiments have been incredibly important obviously, um, in developing life-saving medical interventions, vaccines, uh, uh, surgeries, drug therapies, transplants, the list goes on. Um, but involving them in, uh, involving patients in medical experiments specifically involves them in a degree of risk. An unproven experimental drug or surgery may cause harm to the individual research subject, even if it eventually leads to treatments that can improve the lives of hundreds or even millions of people. And through the middle of the 20th century, this trade-off between risk to participants, um, but the need to perform experiments, provided a perverse rationale that researchers used to justify experience, experiments that wound up killing or maiming research subjects, some of whom were powerless to refuse involvement in the experiment. Um, this includes the infamous experience conducted by Joseph Mengel in Nazi concentration camps. Uh, and uh, 
this involves research where uh, participants were deceived about the risks that they were uh, participating in in an experiment, such as in the Tuskegee syphilis uh, experiment, where a widely available tre treatment for syphilis was withheld from research subjects. And the idea that conducting medical research could hurt participants um, and did hurt participants is in direct conflict with the Hippocratic Oath that doctors have taken for centuries to first do no harm. And yet medical research has the potential to save thousands of lives. This puts biomedical researchers in a bind. As physician researchers, they have dual conflicting duties. As a researcher, their duty is to contribute to general knowledge about humanity, but as medical doctors, as physicians, their duty is to provide the best care to individual patients. And so largely as a result of uh, public horror uh, and the reactions to the kinds of experiments uh, that were happening in the middle of the century in the United States, uh, a group of bioethicists got together to develop a set of principles for conducting biomedical research that would address the controversies of the past decades and attempted to resolve this bind that medical researchers inevitably found themselves in. The bioethicists wrote a report called the Belmont Report that outlined a set of principles called the Belmont Principles intended to help resolve this tension. The first of these principles was respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. Uh, respect for persons is often implemented through informed consent. The idea is that people should know that they're in an experiment and should be free to opt out of it, that they can't be coerced. Um, and respect for persons also includes respect for privacy. Uh, for example, the fact is uh, that someone is in an experiment should not be disclosed or used to harm them uh, or used against them. Uh, uh, respect for persons also includes autonomy. People should be free to opt out. They have control of their bodies. Um, and special care should be taken for those who may have less autonomy, children, coma patients, et cetera. Beneficence refers to balancing harms with benefits. Research experiments should opt for the least risky interventions possible to prove the case. Uh, they should look to already available data uh, that can be obtained without subjecting more people to harm. Uh, they, the, and any risks to patients should be balanced with potential benefits. So it may not be worth exposing people to a great risk for a cure for baldness, for example, uh, but for something that prevents a threat of death to many people, uh, a higher risk may be tolerable in an experiment. Patients should be monitored to make sure that a risk don't exceed expectations. Finally, justice refers to the risks and rewards of being, uh, being distributed equitably in society. Poor people shouldn't be sub uh, subjected to uh, experiments to provide cures that only rich people will be able to afford, for example. Um, and justice refers to the idea that uh, research subjects shouldn't be drawn from uh, only from already vulnerable populations, um, as happened in the Tuskegee experiment. So these principles are well and good uh, as far as they go. Uh, for experimental research, they hold up. Um, and But because they were designed for biomedical research, they work particularly well in that context. Um, but many forms of digital data research differ from uh, laboratory medical research and produce uh, different relationships between individuals, risks, and harms. So human, the human, our traditional sort of human subjects paradigm conceptualizes risks, harms, and benefits in really specific ways. The risks of harms accrue to individual research subjects. You're taking a risk by being in a study. Um, and it may be things like an adverse ex uh, effect from experimental drug or breach of privacy from having uh, your, your uh, activity as a research participant revealed. Um, meanwhile, the benefits in this paradigm accrue to society more broadly. We all benefit from having a new drug that comes out of this research without having to put our own well being at risk necessarily. There is a gap, though, between risks and harms, uh, risks, uh, harms, and benefits for human subjects and for digital data research subjects. Digital data research projects collect data from platforms that are in widespread use, like government service databases, phones, social media, so on. For digital data research projects, some benefits may actually accrue to the individual. They get to use a platform, or sometimes they get to use a phone, right? They're sometimes given a phone. Um, and they you know, get the experience of sort of being online. Um, but some of the risks are, and at least some of the risks are societal. So there may be individual benefits and societal risks. Um, and if a data research project learns something about a category of people from a small study, it can extrapolate out 
and make decisions about all members of that category or what, what the researcher decides are all members of that category. And the harms, potential harms are pervasive. They involve people outside the scope of the experiment um, and they are persistent. The data can be repurposed for other research projects because they are often exempted from uh, prior, further institutional review because they are already collected data. So the standard toolkit for making decisions about biomedical research, making people fill out informed consent forms, locking the clinical files in a safe um, and so on, don't, do not necessarily work for data research. Um, and it's pretty obvious that a new toolkit is needed. So data research and traditional laboratory research are different. Um, and that makes it difficult to apply some of the recommendations from the Belmont report to data research. So when the Purvey team started thinking together about this uneasy fit, we immediately thought about a similar difficulty our, our own disciplinary practice of ethnography had had with onboarding the recommendations of the Belmont report. And we began to realize that lessons from the ways that anthropology and other ethnographic research traditions have navigated these tensions can also inform data research ethics. So data science has more in common with ethnography than is immediately obvious. The instruments are really different, human senses instead of digital sensors, individual sense making instead of algorithmic pattern matching. But both forms of research rely on integration and interpretation of multiple data streams. And both require judgment about what features of a context are relevant for meaning making. And the ethical challenges resonate between these methods as well. In a classic ethnographic methods textbook, um, Spradley writes, no matter how unobtrusive, ethnographic research always pries into the lives of informants. Participant observation represents a powerful tool for invading other people's way of life. It reveals information that can be used to affirm their rights, interests, and sensitivities, or to violate them. Substitute the words data science or digital data research, and the concern is the same. Reflecting first and foremost on whether data use will affirm the rights, interests, and sensitivities of the people it documents, or alternatively violate those interests, should be a first order concern for trustworthy data science. Ethnographers' dedication to the rights and interests of subjects of participant observation comes from a long and painful history of the use of ethnographic methods. The history of ethnographic research is also one of colonialism. The earliest, earliest ethnographies were conducted by American and European academics through fieldwork among indigenous peoples. And this practice continued well into the 1980s. As post-colonial movements took hold in academia and particularly within anthropology, scholars began to uh, grapple with the ethics of this work and the recentering of the rights of and obligations to research subjects. Um, and that was a result of this field-wide reckoning. And so today, ethnographers are reflected uh, are expected to reflect on their power as researchers, as well as on what they are taking from the communities that they study. Ethical concerns in early ethnographies were not limited to colonialism, but also extended to other historically disenfranchised groups. One of the most famous examples of controversy over ethical issues in ethnography surrounded Laud Humphrey's 1968 dissertation and his later book titled Tea Room Trade, Impersonal Sex in Public Places. In this study, Humphreys conducted observations of male-male sexual encounters in public restrooms known as tea rooms. Humphreys disguised his identity and his purpose as a researcher. He did not obtain consent from his participants and he used license plate numbers to discover the identities of the otherwise anonymous men from the West restrooms. The ethics of tea room trade caused an uproar at the time and they're still debated within sociology. So digital data researchers may not be as obviously entangled with colonialism as anthropologists, but we do use tools and methods entangled with other problematic practices. Data biased by historical injustices and data collected frequently without participant awareness in the name of surveillance and commercial interests rather than the direct interests of data subjects. And that data can be repurposed for reasons beyond what participants may have consented to if they did consent in the first place. So if digital research data is to be trustworthy, we need to explicitly grapple with the fact that our data and our methods are used for, are also used for surveillance and control. So ethnographers reflections on awareness of their research subjects and their power relationship with research sites, I think can be inspiring for data researchers as well. 
Along with the Pervade research team, uh, we have argued that researchers using pervasive data collections or passive data collections should probe appropriateness and complex potential harms using two lenses that are directly inspired by, by ethnography. First, data scientists can learn from ethnographers contextual sensitivity and experience by helping research subjects interpret research participation by reflecting on awareness. Ethnographers have developed a suite of tools uh, for uh, 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 techniques and tools to gain the trust of participants. Uh, first, ethnographers must gain what they call entree, which is the permission of participants to be in their space and lives. Ethnographers frequently encourage research, research participants to read parts or all of their analysis and their findings using techniques like participant checking to check the validity of their observations and findings. Some ethnographic traditions move beyond entree and participant checking to collaborative ethnography, which involves people in the creation of research goals, data collection, analysis, authorship, and dissemination. Data researchers can also learn from ethnographers' reflections on power. Ethnographers uh, were dealing with a legacy of distrust due to their use of the tools of colonialism. Data researchers are dealing with a legacy of distrust due to our use of the tools of pervasive surveillance. We are bound up in the tech lash too. So over time, ethnographers made efforts to diversify their discipline and shifted their topic of, of study by including studying up, performing ethnographic research on, on groups that were more or less equally rather than less socially powerful than researchers. So what might analogous reflections on awareness and power look like in research using passive data streams? To think about what awareness and power look like in digital data research, we found it helpful to start from the data itself by mapping data collected from digital devices and interactions on two spectra. This is a heuristic for thinking about where data come from that can help reason about what people's reasonable expectations uh, about that data might be um, and what will be done with it. So first, people's data gets collected somewhere along the continuum of private to public. Private data might get collected with an implicit or explicit expectation of privacy, especially for things like medical records or financial documents. Um, and yet this private information might end up in data sets used for one research purpose or another. Um, and public information, as we know, gets collected for research as well. Twitter feeds, census data, likes on a YouTube video are all public data. Um, second, data can be more or less intentionally created. When I press, press send on a tweet, I know that I'm putting something out there into the world, just as like I know when I'm liking a video or fi filling out a census form. But I'm also contributing information to data sets unintentionally all the time. I don't intend to create a log of my locations every time I open a Google product on my phone. Um, I also don't know when my keystrokes are being automatically logged on a web form or that my IP address is being logged when I watch Netflix. But these data are nevertheless being automatically created. So most digital data used in research falls somewhere along this chart that I'm showing. Uh, broadcasts are public data and were intended to be so by the person they pertain, they pertain to. I know when I'm tweeting, I generally want it to be public to other people, but there are shades of gray. I might post something on Facebook and think it is only going to be seen by my contacts, for example. Secrets are private, but I know when I'm sharing them and creating them and sharing them, and I usually have a pretty firm set of expectations about the circumstances under what they'll, which they'll be kept secret. When I tell my doctor something, I'm, I know they may enter it into my health record, but I know that that record is supposed to be kept confidential by my doctor or within the health system that I'm in. Exhaust data is available and created in public, but it's generated without me necessarily taking an action. It's truly passive data. Traffic data that includes a count of my car, CCTV camera footage, a satellite photo of my house, these are all exhaust data out there in the world about me. And espionage data is also passive data created without an action or intention on my part, but it's created in more private settings and frequently without my knowledge. So this would include telemetry data from my phone being collected without my awareness by a company like Android, uh, or a piece of malware that was collecting keystroke data from private text messages. Um, and a lot of the data we think about when we talk about passive data collection and research is espionage data and has to be treated pretty carefully. 
Um, and there are shades of gray for all of this. Um, and you know, these, it's a spectrum, right? So some data are gonna fall kind of in the middle of categories uncomfortably. Um, but I think that thinking about where data come from like this uh, can help serve as a starting point for thinking about the ethical implications of data research. And just because data comes from one box doesn't make it completely ethical to use um, or completely unethical to use if it comes from another box. Each box has its own implications and sort of its own obligations for researchers. So the first of these have to do with informed consent. Just because someone posted a broadcast intentionally doesn't mean that they consented to it being used for a research project. We can ask how do the terms of service or other agreements users might have made um, around that data affect whether it's permissible to use that data for a research project. Um, are there norms on that site that where we're collecting from or even sub communities within that site for sharing or reusing data. Um, and we can also ask what objections people might have for their data being used in a project and whether or not it's feasible to obtain their consent as part of that research project. Um, and for, for instance, health researchers using espionage data, I would argue that the needs for increasing participant awareness for data collection are very high, right? The, the closer we move to espionage, the higher our obligations to make or to help participants understand what we're collecting, why we're collecting it, what it means about them. I you know, want to emphasize public data has implications for privacy too, right? Um, even, even if data is created in public, there are privacy implications. Uh, while someone may have shared, for example, example, their mental health status on Twitter, they may have been part of a community who follow each other. Um, and having their mental health status shared in a research paper may be a totally different matter for privacy. And even if data is delinked from personal identity, it can be used to re-identify people and reveal things about them that they may not want shared. So geolocation data, for instance, can be used to follow someone from a public event, say a protest, to their home. And finally, data that has been purposely anonymized to hide who it's connected to can sometimes be de-anonymized, as numerous studies have shown. So we think that it's important to interrogate your data, and this becomes part of reflecting on your power as a researcher. Um, thinking about data sources can help us think about principles of justice around data as well. Does the data you're using come from a particularly vulnerable population? Is it more likely to produce errors when it's applied to a population that has historically been harmed by such errors? Does it help a less vulnerable population at the expense of a more vulnerable population? And does the research design include members of the group it's uh, targeted at helping? Particularly in the US, but also in non-US contexts, data-driven technical developments have been designed for the targeted oppression of minorities and have failed to live up to their liberatory promises. Pervasive data researchers should consider these power relations. Consider whether it's appropriate to make a given community or population more vulnerable by creating new forms of data or through secondary uses of data. This consideration might involve spending time physically or virtually in a community to understand their norms, collaborating with a community to serve their needs, or speaking to gatekeepers to understand specific harms. For example, amplifying content beyond its intended audience. Pervasive data research should emphasize the standard drawn from political representation movements and disability activism. Nothing about us without us. Using pervasive data to study populations without significant representation from these uh, groups risks erasing the standpoints and lived experiences of the people behind that data. And just as in ethnography, there's an argument for studying up, studying people with significant social or political power, health systems, insurance companies for whom public accountability is important. Okay, of course, we realize that determining sort of your own power with relative to research subjects is a complex process. And this kind of reflection is a big ask. Um, but we are living in a time of numerous helpful frameworks to help you do this for thinking through issues of power that have been adapted specifically for diverse and varied forms of digital data research, including feminism, anti racism, anti colonialism and queer theory. Um, just last week, I came across this excellent article by Pence et al. Um, this is from uh, this, this year's Kai, uh, From Treatment to Healing, Env Envisioning a Decolonial uh, Digital Mental Health. So methods for addressing power in digital mental health research are on the rise. Right? This is a, um, there are resources out there to help you do this. And these frameworks can help provide concrete guidance to researchers who are considering how their protocols might unevenly subject uh, participants to increased vulnerability.
Digital device users are already quite vulnerable as their traces are turned into data by researchers, corporations, and governments. We hope that digital data research will embrace reflections on how to decrease this vulnerability. We'll hold each other to higher ethical standards, particularly with respect to openness with research subjects and reflexivity on power and impact. Reflections on awareness and power are not necessarily required of digital data researchers by existing institutional regulatory structures like IRBs. IRBs are probably not going to ask you to do this. Um, but within ethnographic research, reflections like these have become bound up with the definitions and norms of ethical research and of good, good methods um, and good practice. They're expected of researchers. We teach our students to do this. Um, and it's hard to get your work published if you don't. So both individual researchers and the professional organizations that support pervasive data research can contribute to a more trustworthy research community. So we hope that researchers will lead the way on awareness and power with their students and collaborators, and that journal and conference reviewers will look for these reflections in the method sections of papers. Uh, the Purvey team has been conducting interviews with data scientists um, who are fo focused on how they navigate issues of awareness and power in their research. And um, these are still under analysis. We're just uh, starting the analysis of these interviews, but a spoiler alert for our emerging finding is that data scientists are already successfully grappling with these issues and their practices for navigating them tend to look a lot like those of qualitative researchers. We've heard numerous stories of researchers spending time in the communities that they're studying to learn the nuances of how data is shared and the expectations of participants. For example, telling students that they're not uh, allowed to harvest, you know, so you tell your grad students that you're not allowed to harvest data about a game, uh, digital gameplay until you spent 100 hours playing that game yourself. Um, we've heard about researchers thinking critically about whether and how they should perform research on vulnerable populations and striving towards more participatory forms of big data research. Um, we've heard examples of writing positionality statements, which are really common and qualitative work um, uh, in data science publications. Um, and we've heard stories about turning the substantial tools of data science uh, onto structures of power rather than individual people. So using pervasive data to study political campaigns and advertisers and the platforms themselves. So asking these questions of your data analysis and documenting them in your outputs is a crucial step towards addressing the ethical implications of your work. Um, but it can't just be researchers who are asking these questions. Review committees, referees, and professional organizations can all incorporate these lines of inquiry into how they assess the ethical implications of data research. Um, IRBs are already a powerful force for trust building on campuses, uh, but none of what we're recommending is required under current law, and much of data science is not considered human subjects research. So can we incorporate IRB in trust building without overburdening IRB staff? Um, these, you know, IRBs are already centers of research, expert, uh, research ethics expertise on campuses, um, and they're already being consulted around blurry lines, for instance, um, using student data and things like that in research. IRBs get these questions. Um, so how could researchers tap into their expertise around forms of awareness that aren't formal consent processes, um, their knowledge of power relationships between researchers and research subjects? I think it's worth thinking through how IRBs can be our ally um, in changing cultures of how data are used. Uh, paper reviews are another area where we can uh, build mechanisms for data science ethics into the structures we already rely upon for trust and research more generally. Reviewers can expect and prompt authors uh, for reflections on the whys and hows of awareness and power. Um, and this is already happening formally and informally in places like uh, ACM SIGCHI, which has a research ethics committee to help reviewers uh, when they run into research ethics issues, and uh, NURIPS, which is a natural language processing conference, uh, which requires authors to put their work in context, that's a quote, and reflect on potential harms as well as appropriate uses of human data sets. We also hope that professional organizations will establish professional norms and codes for trustworthy pervasive data research, as anthropologists and sociologists have done. Um, this can consist of setting up clear guidelines and procedures to follow, but it can also consist of peers modeling for each other what trustworthy practices are um, and uh, peer checking of research methodologies in the research design phase, right? It's, it's one thing at the publication phase to say this wasn't ethical research, it's better if that can be done at the uh, research design phase so things can be changed on the ground. So peer checking is going to be an important part of this pro uh, process um, and publishing methodological reflections on trustworthy research practices in professional trade journals. You know, if you've done something innovative in your research ethics practices, please share it in a, you know, a trade publication or somewhere, a medium post, someplace where other people can see it, right? Um, because sharing these stories is going to be an important piece of um, moving forward together. 
So I'm going to end here with a link to my project websites, my email address, as well as Manny's email address and his project websites in case you'd like to follow up with either of us. And I'd love to take some questions. I think we have some good time for questions. Well, uh, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, and folks, go ahead and start putting uh, your questions into the Q&A. Um, you know, often people wait until the last two minutes and then uh, pile them all in. So don't, don't, don't do that. Um, I'll start off with, you know, this is a great talk. So I have a, a couple of, a few questions I can start us off with. I mean, one is, you know, when you talk about consenting people, you know, it seems like, you, you know, people don't necessarily understand what they're consenting to. I mean, you know, Certainly for IRBs, I mean, they, they have gotten so, you know, so much information that I don't think people read them. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult for people to understand. And then also the concepts. I mean, like, for example, we've done studies with, uh, you know, accessing the data on people's phones and they consent to it. But then they come back later and they see a question and they're like, what are you doing? So they don't necessarily understand what we're getting and I don't know, you know, if you start talking about using the data, moving it, I don't know that they necessarily understand that either. So, for example, uh, you know, one paper that we were, and you were on the paper, you know, we saw, we asked people, you know, who they would share different kinds of data with. And, you know, they were very willing to share data with their doctor, but they were not willing to share it with the EHR, which is yeah. what you need to get it in. So, so, so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how to navigate this, this problem that people don't understand what they're necessarily consenting to. Yeah, there's a really good um, uh, paper by some law scholars about the sort of, they call it pathologies of consent. Um, it's by uh, Wood, Woody uh, Hartzog and, uh, oh, I'm gonna forget the second author, I'll look it up. But, um, uh, but if you Google Woody, uh, it will come up. And they talk about this concept that we, you know, consent, so I, this is something I haven't even tackled in this talk, right? But I think it's really worth talking about that consent is, sort of a performance of ethicality in many in many ways, right? And that we, but we are misusing consent. That consent is best, they argue that consent is best for situations where you understand, clearly understand the stakes and where you don't have to give it often, right? Like you 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 should only give consent infrequ infrequently and when you truly understand the stakes. And the, those situations are few and far between in our lives, right? Uh, maybe going in for major surgery, right? Uh, something like that, where you've been, somebody sat with you and explained, um, or, you know, in our personal lives, we can all think of like examples where we, you know, we've all been actually dealing with masks and, you know, consent and uh, complicated interpersonal dynamics around that, right? But um, yes, we've broken it when we start making people consent to every service that they sign up for, right? They're just like clicking boxes and that we had started breaking it with research and then like requiring, you know, long forms um, and not a lot of feedback on what it actually means and what it might look like. And um, yeah, so this is this is a separate and independent problem. And it's, it's a bit why we have been, no, it's a, sorry, an interrelated problem. It's not a separate problem. It's an interrelated problem. Um, it's a bit why we've been talking about awareness because awareness is, a uh, fuzzier, which is not great, right? Like consent is the hard form of awareness, but consent is so difficult to do well, especially when it comes to digital data, that we wonder if there aren't other forms of engagement with communities. And this is actually something that ethnographers have really struggled with too, right? So ethnographers often are, IRBs ask them to get consent at the beginning of their project, and they do, but folks kind of don't understand that, yeah, and I also now I'm going to be at every meeting you're in from now on, and I'm going to, you know, judge you, <laughs> right? And so, and so what you do as an ethnographer is you continually navigate that, right? You like remind people of your presence, you show them what you're saying about them and you ask them to respond. Like there are all of these things that you sort of do throughout the research life cycle that are ongoing forms of consent, right? Like, is it really still okay that I'm here? And like, here's what I'm finding. Can you tell me if that's way off? And if so, can we have a discussion about what I might be seeing and what you might be seeing? And so I think we have to, do things like that with people's data, right? There may be a consent, an official consent process at the beginning, uh, but then there are reflection points throughout, right? Those points where you say, hey, this is what I'm seeing about you. And you could be a single person, but you could also be a group, right? Like may maybe you just do this with leaders. You know, there are scale issues here, right? You might not be able to do this with all 200,000 people in your study, but you might be able to 
show groups of people results in meaningful ways and get you know feedback on those results before you publish and things like that or you know help them help have them help you make sharing decisions about that data down the line um, i think there just have to be much more ongoing processes um, whether that's whether we call that consent or whether we call it something like entree or participant checking or some of these other things that come up in the ethnographic paradigm um, the last piece there was something oh and then right so people the problem of understanding the consequences and also the um, inferences that we can draw with data is I think a really big one. Um, I think this will start to change. This is where I think we're already seeing data literacy um, as something that more people are uh, grappling with, or, or at least we know, like for instance, we were talking a little bit earlier about all of the data science projects or uh, programs that are launching in universities are, you know, that this is being seen as an important skill set, but also there are data literacy programs, right, launching within other majors, right, uh, you know, we need to be able to understand data, we need to understand what it means, um, you know, when people draw incorrect conclusions with data as well as correct conclusions there's you know the great uh calling bullshit movement and things like that where that's you know taking down people's quantitative claims um so all of this is part of you know just like i mean we, we participation in research we we think about it as something which always existed but it didn't always exist right it's it's a paradigm we built over time through experience with people um and we now we need to rebuild that paradigm with data um and that you know that's it's going to take a lot of um, both sort of public education, but also experience, right? Like people being you know, being part of our studies and getting feedback, giving us feedback um, and vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. And we're starting to get questions, but I, I, I think, yeah. you, you know, what I'm hearing you say is that we need to kind of almost rethink what consent is, is, is not something that at one point in time with these data, but an ongoing process. So like, you know, we collect, you know, GPS data from people showing them what we're seeing, you know, that enables them to understand better than a consent form, you know, what what they're, you know, what they're giving us. Yeah, as much experiential yeah. learning as we can give people yeah. about like their data. And, what and then means, giving better. them uh, the opportunity to revoke that, uh, that, that, that consent. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, in, in cases so. where that will work for, you know, and I realize there are projects where it might not work to have revocation, for instance, but, you know, at least in those cases, we have a person who will say, okay, well, I'm not going to sign up for your study again, right? You know, like there, there are sort of, um, right, the more we can do, the better. I, I think we all recognize that not every project will be able to sort of be as transparent as it needs to be for various research findings. And, you know, this is another thing that people have navigated forever is like, how much do you tell participants? And, but, you know, what we want to do is we want to be as explicit about those decisions in our publications as we can be. Like, here's what I didn't tell them and here's why. All right, so I'm going to start. We have now uh, a number of questions here. So I'll start with uh, the first. Beth uh, says, asks, uh, considering that many consent forms are now viewed on mobile devices, do you have any recommendations for how to present or display consent to truly enhance understanding and promote digital, uh, digital health literacy? Yeah, this is such a good question. I get asked this question all the time. And I never have a good answer because, partially because, um, I'm not a designer, uh, and it's sort of yes, designed for information literacy is definitely not my personal strong point. Um, mm -hmm. And partially because we don't, there's no really great standard of how, knowing how to do this. I mean, there's been some really good work in say video consent, right? And like there's sort of, sort of emerging new ways of doing consent. So there's some good work out there. That's that's not mine, right? I'm going to point you towards. Um, but you know, uh, this question of like what are the critical details that somebody needs to know are going to vary study to study. Um, and they're going to have to do not only with data collection, as we've been talking about, you know, the procedures, the kinds of data that you need, but also the implications of that collection, right? Who's it going to be shared with? What am I going to know about you? Um, am I going to yeah, do I, are there other checks where we can check in about this down the line, right? Like, I think those are the things that as a participant, I would want to know, right? Is like, what are those data types? What are you going to know about me? And can I check in with you about this ever again, right? Like, I, I, or when am I going to know what you know? Um, are there, you know, sort of ways for me to, to better understand the implications of, of saying yes to this? Um, so those are the things I try and get front and center. How to do that well is a, is a design, an information design challenge that, um, that I don't know enough about <laughs> information design to tell you how to do well. But there are, you know, good folks working on it. Right. Uh, and then... Uh... Anne asks a, a similar question in asking children to consent also, do they really, do they really understand? 
Yeah. So children are also a really good opportunity for sort of more participatory uh, uh, approaches to consent when possible because a we want them to have data literacy, right? Like this is an important thing for their future to be able to do and, and understand. But of course, just like in traditional research, you know, we don't just ask kids for permission. We hopefully engage with them, depending on how old the kids are, right? You know, uh, uh, young children, we talk to uh, uh, their grownups, right? And uh, and try and figure out, um, you know, how, what, what the grownups understand as well as what the kids understand. But I, you know, I, I just, I think there are no downsides to trying to help the kids understand as much as we can about what's happening because they are, they are the digital stakeholders going forward, right? Like they, like the more that they can understand how this works, the more likely, hopefully they will be willing to be research subjects later in their lives, like as we need them to be, right? Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think um, we, we should try and get kids as involved as we can in these uh, more participatory ways. Okay, uh, another from Matthew Bowman. Uh, you alluded to the common rule, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on how it is being used to be a catch-all to clear legal limitations on data use uh, but is kind of insufficient for real protections, at least in my opinion. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I yeah, I don't think it it protects digital data well. Um, and you know, it, it, interesting, it was revised. The common rule was just revised, right? Um, in the process of what, five or six years ago. Although, what is time? Maybe it's more like seven years ago at this point. But it was, um, and I think if that revision had happened just three years later, we would have had a more concrete discussion about digital data. I, so I was not part of those conversations, but. Um, I worked with someone who was, and, and she was, I, from what I can understand, one of the sort of few people who was there saying, we need to be rethinking digital data, but it was seven years ago and it, we just weren't there yet with data science, right? As sort of uh, on everybody's radar. Um, and so the common rule remains, and in fact actually got a little bit even easier to reuse data sets under the common rule, uh, the revisions to the common rule um, without IRB scrutiny. So. So that's the situation we're in here now. Um, now, other legislative pieces surrounding data are also on the move right now, right? So we have GDPR in Europe and lots of confusion around, you know, what researchers can and can't do with uh, data from European data subjects, um, because it will kind of depend on how it's interpreted in whatever court system you get sued in, right? Um, so there's GDPR, there's starting to be movement on the ground in the US um, you know, for comprehensive privacy legislation. Um, it's, we're starting to see it at the state level anyway. Um, so, you know, uh, <laughs> these all, these questions sort of get into the check with counsel, um, you know, again, not a lawyer. So how to comply with California data, data regulations is something campuses I know are sort of spinning up right now um, and trying to figure out um, you know how to how to treat um, legal protections um, and that's a bit why at, at the pervade project we've really moved into saying hey you know follow the law that's important but we have additional ethical obligations as researchers to consider and you know the right IRBs aren't going to tell you to consider power uh, necessarily right they are not going to they're not going to tell you you should increase participant awareness even if you don't need formal consent by their model, right? But we think you should, and we should all act like we should, right? Like we should hold each other to this standard or else we just risk perpetuating sort of surveillance norms of data use, um, which everybody else is doing right now. Um, and, you know, let's not be part of that. Let's, let's as researchers, let's try to take a step back and gain participant trust, uh, regain participant trust. So yeah, I think we just have to, we, we are like operating at the level of individual researchers, review panels, and, um, uh, professional societies, because that's where we have influence. And it's also, interestingly, this is the model that worked within ethnography, right? So we had this realization a few years into the project. We had been sort of construing this project as like, we should have a new Belmont, right? And we'll have a big summit at the end of Pervade, and we will get everybody together, and we'll make the rules. Um, and then we were like, that's not what anthropology did, right? Like, Belmont's not the model here. Anthro is the model, right? It's cultural change within how research is done, and how we think about good research that is the model. Um, I, we think this is a, you know, you can, you can definitely argue it's, it's definitely a softer model, right? Than new regulation would be um, or changing the common rule would be. And like, you know, I'm open to that too. We can have those conversations if there's will to do it. Um, but I think we can change the culture of research ethics first. <laughs> oh, careful up on that, I think you raised a really interesting question is we're talking about uh, different communities, though. Policy, social sciences grew up in a set of communities. And then we think about how do we 
for us here, for example, in this webinar, how do we think about this within kind of the medical clinical sciences community, which are raised in different traditions too, and how to think about these issues? I think the questions you raised here are ones that a lot of us already are thinking about the power and sort of, but there's also a broader community. And so I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about how do we take these lessons? And I and I completely get your ethnographic arguments because I, you know, having lived through that. Um, how do we think about translating it? Because I think this is, you know, uh, another way I frame this is if this if you gave this talk to a Kai community, everybody be yes. You know, I think if you gave it talk to her, ask the people, I'll say yes. But then we start thinking about how do we incorporate this? So I, I'm just curious in your thoughts if you if your team has started to think about this translation across communities and uh, and how to kind of think about it. This is, a, this is such a good question. Um, and only, we have only just started to, to think about that. And we've been thinking a lot about sort of what the next steps for this project are and on all of us as researchers. And I think this question of translation through different communities of practice, um, uh, and different sort of research practices is is the big next question. Um, uh, so what might that look like? So educational settings are sort of a clear first place to start talking about these things. You know, could we um, could we you know do sort of talks or courses in data science programs uh, within different kinds of traditions, right? So data, so we have a social data science at Maryland, right? And that's all about um, the social, traditional social sciences and data. Well, could we also do that within uh, medical data science context, right? Or, and, and, and how would we need to adjust these classes, right? To like speak on the ground to these communities. And I think that that in itself would be a really interesting um, Set of challenges to, to face. So, you know, could we try, could we try for like five or six different diverse programs, right, with, with very different research traditions um, and sort of make it work, you know, figure out what it would take to make it work, to make it relevant, to make it uh, practical on the ground. Um, so I think that might be one way to approach it. Um, another way to approach, one, another thing we've been sort of starting to think about and starting to do is um, showing up at different conferences essentially and participating in, you know, big conferences in the sort of pervasive data space, but within different disciplines, right? Um, and having a, 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 an ethics booth where people could come ask their questions, but then also going to talks, which are using pervasive data and asking probing questions and, you know, starting conversations um, within these professional communities, both to norm ourselves to what are the issues right on the ground um, with sort of translating these ideas um, and you know how, how might we do it better how can we inform our thinking with the fields we haven't been thinking about right because of course we haven't been thinking about every field right we're so limited um, and so you know like sort of informing ourselves so again this is such a like ethnographic way of thinking right we'll just go to the sites and then we'll learn about them and then we'll have better translation um, but I think it's a, a viable way so we've been talking about the road show right we're going to go put on this road show where we go to all these conferences and um, and chat with people and and hopefully inform um, our ways of thinking so that they are more applicable. Um, and then finally, I think I really do think that like the medium post slash technical, uh, you know, a tech, uh, tech publication route is, is a good one, right? Like if we could get what's the version of this article that exists in CACM, right? That's easy for us to write, we're going to do that. But then, you know, wh what in, you know, what, how does this play out in mental health practitioner spaces, right? Um, or, or research practitioner spaces. So yeah, I, I, th you know, I'm, I am open for ideas of, of how to do this translation work across uh, communities. Cause you're right, data science is like a set of tools. It's not, it's not a research tradition, right? It's not, it's, uh, it's, be, it's research being done within dozens or you know, 50 research traditions. I don't even know how many research traditions. So how do we talk to all of those? Uh, a huge challenge. All right, uh, a few more questions here. Uh, Kelsey Ragsdale uh, asks, what are some of the newer strategies for gaining ethical consent? Uh, online consent seems to be mandatory for any system you use. And if you don't consent, you are locked out of most services. Yes, so there's the service abuse of consent, which I think we talk a little bit about, right? This sort of, that goes into that pathologies of consent idea that you know, services have sort of broken consent by asking us to constantly consent. Um, and to 
also just, you know, as researchers, like I think it's important for us to be aware of that sort of forced consent model when we use data from platforms. Um, so, you know, as we partner with platforms, um, which, you know, we should because platforms shouldn't have all of this data and not make new knowledge, right? You know, like it's important to, to have researchers have access as a separate ethical issue, but important to talk about uh, access to platform data. Um, but we are also using data that has been sort of forcibly consented to. So then what does that mean for us? As we, you know, who would not, we would hopefully not set that up in the first place. So I think, so that, um, that issue is one of, uh, you know, maybe we need to reconsent, maybe we need uh, different forms of outreach, you know, that would be beyond consent um, to those folks um, who have been, <laughs> they've consented, yes, to having their data sent to researchers, but they didn't realize it because it was rolled in with a whole bunch of other things, right? Um, so there's, that's the first part. The, the first part of the question was about emerging best practices in online consent. Was that the, did I get the first part right? Yeah, I think it's just, what are some of the newer strategies? Newer strategies, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, you know, the, the things that we've have been seeing are a combination of, um, you know, accessible language slash uh, so things like video consent, right? Accessible language slash uh, engagement of various sorts um, around consent and then participatory checkpoints that are beyond consent, right? That, that keep people engaged in the research experience in various ways. All right, uh, uh, two more questions here. One from uh, Jonah Mayerhoff. Uh, how do you navigate privacy concerns that you don't necessarily anticipate in advance? For example, much like genomic research, uh, on old biological tissue, we cannot always anticipate the advances in computational techniques or analyses that future individuals will be able to perform on old data sets. What are some of the best practices for navigating and preserving privacy for participants when new analytic methods are discovered? This is such a good question um, because reuse of these data sets is, is uh, important, but ethically fraught for exactly this reason, um, and that people may not be identifiable now, but might be identifiable later, um, or the implications that we find about people may be, you know, things that they were not expecting um, as our, our uh, methods proceed. Um, there's a real, there's a real challenge here, and this is a real challenge in tech ethics broadly, which is that, you know, predicting the negative implications of a data set, of a tool, of an analysis technique into the future is a fraught art, right? It's it's worth trying to do, um, and you will not get everything right, right? Like, uh, and, and and both I think are just going to be true. So, you know, as you are collecting data, as you are, uh, you know, putting you know stripping identifiers from the data, as you are um, you know, deciding what features you're going to collect, like what kinds of, you know, things that could potentially become identifiers in the future, but are identifiers now, you know, having this awareness, right, that like, it, as things change, are there risks in my data set? And can I spot any of them now? It's worth trying to do. And it also will not be perfect. You can't predict the future, right? Um, but the more identifiers that are in that data, the more likely it is to happen, right? Um, or the more sort of potential identifiers, um, you know, uh, there are ways so right now, best practices tend to be around restricting use of up, mashing those that your data up with other data sets, and those you know those are tools too. These are policy tools where you say, right, you can reuse my data, but you need to promise not to try and match it to Twitter users, right? Um, or you need to promise not to try and match it. This is this happens right now with um, the Facebook URL data set. So Facebook has uh, made uh, a data set of uh, URLs available that have been. Um, uh, like fact checked essentially. So this is used a lot by misinformation researchers and things like that. Um, but you know, it's Facebook users <laughs> didn't necessarily like, you know, they, they, you, you, you could potentially re-identify this data. And so what they do is they ask you to sign an agreement that says you're not going to try to uh, de-identify that data. And so we use policy tools, even though, you know, researchers could probably de-identify the data, but you're gonna promise not to. Um, and so I think that is a very reasonable strategy um, as we go forward to sort of say, yeah, in the future, you may be able to re-identify this data 
please do not try, <laughs> right? Um, we, if you're going to reuse this data, it's on you to not try and do that. So policy, you know, using all the policy tools we have, um, trusted repositories are probably going to be a part of this down the line, right? We need places to store this data. We're going to enforce policy mechanisms around what we can and can't do uh, with reuse of data sets going forward. Um, and I think that's something, you know, that's just sort of starting to be talked about is where, who, 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 where do these data sets live and who's responsible for um, enforcing future uses of the data? Um, because yes, I think we should assume that future bad things we can't see could happen with this data. And then, you know, we should use our very human tools to just try and prevent that from happening as much as possible. All right, and uh, the last question here from Adam Goodkin. Um, what are your thoughts on studies that require deceit? Uh, I'm writing my thesis about keystroke patterns and social dynamics. I couldn't mention keystrokes before the experiment because I didn't want participants to be self-conscious of their typing during, the con during a conversation. Of course, I disclosed the full experiment in addition to post in an additional post-experiment consent form. But do you feel an experiment that only provides incomplete information beforehand is a violation of privacy? No. No, I think that you're doing exactly the right thing, right? That we we actually have developed pretty good norms in, in different fields around deceit um, and that those norms do absolutely apply even in the use of pervasive data and digital data that we know we do a debrief afterwards. Um, and that you sort of watch for people's reactions in that debrief, right? Um, my guess is that people are, my, my guess just sort of, my instinct is that and unless you're like, you know, asking people to type their secrets into uh, a screen that you then are using, you know, like that the people are probably going to not react badly to that, right? Um, because they've come into a lab, they've met you, you've consented them, you're going to do a debrief with them. Um, yeah, some, uh, you know, when we're doing uh, um, uh, deception, those are all the right things to be doing. And I, then generally people don't react so badly. Um, if you start to get uh, emotional reactions during that debrief, ask yourself what why that might be happening and if there are adjustments you could make on the other end to sort of if people's expectations are wildly blown out of the water by what you have done um, there might be something there right uh, and this is another one of those sort of like ethnographic pieces of advice is just like you know watch as watch as this is happening and adjust if you need to um, but to you know to me that sounds like a really reasonable way to do deception I don't think deception is is inherently unethical um, you know we need it for new knowledge creation but there are ways to do it well and also when you publish about it, you should write all of the things about what, how you did it well. And um, I think you will. <laughs> all right, well, we are uh, just past the hour. So, so Katie, thank you so much. This was, this, this is, uh, you know, I think this is something that a lot of us struggle with. Um, so, and I, I really love the, the, the kind of formulation that you, you, you gave your, um, you know, two axes of, of uh, yeah, yeah, it's it a really helpful framework. So, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, it was great to great to get to talk, and my pleasure. All right, all right, and Take good see care, everybody uh, next month. Bye bye. Bye y'all.